at the risk of sounding crazy from the beginning, I want to share with you a dream that I had recently. Now, the dream was vision-like, but it wasn't this prophetic vision of the eternities. My vision was of junk. In my dream, I discovered a new room in my house upstairs, but the room was full of all of our old discarded furniture, some things that were broken, some things that were out of style, or just a bunch of stuff there, just a bunch of junk. So I quickly start going through this to see if I can find things to throw away again, because I have a particular talent for this. Broken things do not last long around me. But this is where things start to get kind of surreal. Because in a, a Willy Wonka-like moment, the room starts to levitate. And now the floor is made of glass, and I can see into our house below. It's not our current house, which is fairly neat and orderly. It's our house the way it was when we had a bunch of little kids. You know that state when your, your family's growing faster than your income and, and your kids are making messes faster than you can clean them up? So it's chaos everywhere. Plastic toys strewn everywhere, broken Nerf guns and piles of puzzle pieces and books pulled down from the shelves and Legos. Legos everywhere. And lots of like little tiny Legos, those little teeny tiny pieces that have long since lost contact with their original intended sets. And then I look into my little home office and I see my dial-up modem from yesteryear and I see my tower of guilt, which is piles and piles of photographs waiting to be put in scrapbooks and photo albums. All the mess had come back. But strangely, this mess was more beautiful to me than all the supposedly beautiful things that are now in my house. In fact, it was so beautiful to me that in my dream, I just stood there looking at it, crying. And I woke up from this dream thinking how ironic it is that some of life's greatest joys are found in the messy heaps and among all the broken bits. I want to talk about the difference between a dream life and real life, which is messy. Now, most of us, our ancestors, lived in survival mode, trying to have their very basic needs met, like shelter and food and protective clothing. But once life's basic necessities are secured, we begin to strive for a good life. But a good life can very quickly escalate into a dream life, a dream job, a dream house, a dream family. But a dream life is typically a facade, isn't it? masking the realities of life and comparing ourselves to the perceived success of others, this is, the, this is the handiwork of the adversary, that faux painter who rarely signs his work of deception. See, real life, life without filters, is less glamorous. It's duller. It's messy. It's full of disappointment and failure. Things break, and not just broken toys, and broken bones, but broken hopes and, and broken dreams. Even for the seemingly successful, the people who seem to have it all, or, or those that just seem like they have it together. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't always feel like I have it together, and there's not a whole lot in my life that seems perfect. Now, the catalogs may tell, tell me that my children's bedrooms should look like this, but in reality, my children's bedrooms look a lot more like this. And my supposedly dream job teaching leadership People often think I'm jet-setting around the world, that my days look like this. But in reality, most of my days actually look like this, full of flight delays and, and distractions. And my family tree, I wouldn't draw it like you see here. My family tree, unfortunately, looks a lot more like this. I come from a broken home, so does my husband. And there's lots, lots more that I can share, but perhaps all of us feel like we have things in our life that maybe feel broken or that are full of disappointments. Maybe, maybe you had hoped to have graduated from college and to get a good job and have a successful career, or maybe just to have a job. Or maybe you had hoped to serve a mission or to have a child serve a mission or, or to be married or to stay married. Um, maybe you never could have imagined that you would be at this place at this point in your life. And, and perhaps even you feel like some of life's broken promises have rattled you, or it maybe even left you feeling shattered. Is all hope lost? It, 
in this case, are we disqualified from living joyfully? Absolutely not. Um, a messy life full of disappointments and dilemmas can be a beautiful and fulfilling life. Let me share with you a messy moment from several years ago. It's a moment when everything came crashing down. It was, it was an unusually, strangely quiet evening at our house. The girls were upstairs doing homework and the boys were downstairs playing together which was this welcome change because of late they had been completely antagonizing each other with Christian, the 12-year-old, this wildly creative kid who leaves this wake of destruction behind him, with Christian um, physically tormenting his younger brother, Joshua, um, who at seven responded and retaliated with psychological warfare, you know, channeling thoughts like, I might be the baby, but I'm their favorite. Um, my husband was away um, coming back from a business trip, and I sat on my bed reading. Now, this silence was broken by the sound of shattering glass. And I don't mean like the sound of a broken kitchen glass. I mean like the sound of a shattering window or two. I go running downstairs with images of bloody boys and severed limbs going through my mind, and I get to the bottom of the stairs, and I find two frozen boys staring at a curio cabinet that had managed to stay upright despite the body slam that it had taken, but all of its glass shelves and the little treasures in this, this curio cabinet are now in a heap at the bottom, broken. Now, in closer inspection of these two boys, they have very, very different expressions on their face. Um, the seven-year-old looks absolutely terrified, and my 12-year-old looks smug, even self-righteous, as he's pointing to his brother, who for a change is the one who's caused the damage. After a sigh of relief that there are no severed limbs and there's, there's no blood, um, my next worst fear is confirmed. There at the top of this broken heap is the Yadro statue. It's this gorgeous figurine of a mother and a daughter in these beautiful Japanese kimonos. This yadro was a gift to my husband who had served his mission in Japan, and the gift came from his younger brother who had served his mission in Spain where yadro is made. And now it lays broken in pieces. I'm heartbroken knowing that this thing can't be fixed. But what happened next was more precious than that piece of porcelain. Um, Christian, the innocent one in this rare occasion, he had started to go through the rubble trying to find pieces of treasures that could be salvaged, which gave me a moment to pull a scared little seven-year-old aside and, and tell him that compared to him, nothing, nothing in that cabinet had any value at all. Relieved, um, he grabbed a dustbin and he began cleaning up. And I noticed that Christian is taking particular care to find the pieces of this kimono. He knows what it means to his dad and he's now got them laid out on the table. And, and he lays the pieces out and he says, Mom, I can fix this. I can fix this. Now, I wasn't so sure about that. How could a 12-year-old boy with these kind of impulsive, destructive tendencies, how could he fix something so, so delicate? Now, I explained to him, you know, these things never go back together quite right. You know, just that millimeter of glue seems to throw everything off. He was totally undeterred by this. And he said, Mom, where's the super glue? Give me the super glue. I can fix this. And I mumbled something about, you know, I don't know where the glue is, and it's probably dried up. It's always dried up when I need it. And I said, why don't we just get a bag? Let's put the things in the bag, and we'll deal with them this weekend. Well, a minute later, he reappears with the super glue. And unfortunately, it was working. And so as Josh cleaned up, Christian and I sat down. We teamed up, and we started to put this puzzle back together with, with him fitting all of the pieces and doing all the work, me just dispensing little tiny amounts of super glue. And miraculously, it's working. And she has now hands again and arms and shoulders, and we laugh and we cheer and we high-five as this is coming together, and then we get to the head. And we notice there's a piece in the back of the head that's missing. And despite how hard we looked, we never found that piece. We talked about ways that we might fix her with ceramic and maybe some liquid porcelain, and we could try to match the pain. And we decided to leave her just like she was, incomplete and imperfect. 
I called my husband, warned him about what had happened, and an hour later, I watched as my husband came home and my 12-year-old boy beamed with pride and delight as he told his dad about how he had put back together this treasure of his. And I sat at the table basking in this moment, thinking that this was perhaps the sweetest moment I had ever spent with my son. Now, we put that yadro back on the one shelf that survived. Um, and if you look at her closely, you see cracks and fractures. And if you turn her around, you see this hole. But strangely, she is now more of a family treasure. This experience helped me see that great beauty can come from what's been broken. And likewise, there can be healing for the brokenhearted. How do we find hope after we've experienced disappointment? How do we pick up the pieces and put ourselves back together after we feel like we failed? Or maybe just failed to live up to our ideals? And maybe more important than anything else, how do we learn to appreciate all the cracks that are in our life? I want to share three practices, three things that we can do to find more joy um, amid the mess. Now, the first is that, for starters, we can eschew the false god of perfectionism. Elder Jeffrey uh, Holland said in his October 2017 conference address, titled, Be Ye Therefore Perfect, he warned, he cautioned that we should strive for steady improvement without obsessing over what behavioral scientists call toxic perfectionism. Now, most of us know that perfectionism is, is very indeed a toxic trap. And we would be wise not to get caught in it, but we would also be compassionate not to be party to the ensnarement of others. We can be more careful about what we post. We can post what is real rather than what is filtered. And then rather than posting sort of the best angle at our life, we could give people a 360 degree view to not only our successes, but our disappointments. And instead of promoting jealousy, we can promote hope and healing and let other people know that they're not alone. Number two, we can let our own cracks and fractures show. A team of British psychologists said that when people show vulnerability, it creates what they call a beautiful mess effect. What looks like vulnerability to us, it looks like courage to others. And seeking help fosters learning for everyone. Admitting mistakes creates a climate of forgiveness. Dr. Amy Edmondson at the Harvard Business School teaches that when team members reveal failure, it actually creates emotional safety that unifies a team. I've experienced this firsthand with the, with the company that I lead. We have regular quarterly like off-site planning meetings, and we typically start these meetings with a round of check-ins and then reviewing some of the successes of the past quarter and celebrating those successes. But recently, I tried something different. Instead of asking people to share something they were proud of, I asked people to share something that was disappointing. Something that they had hoped to have gotten done the previous quarter that actually hadn't gotten done. Actually something that was supposed to have gotten done. Or maybe something that didn't go quite right. Now at first people look at me like, are you for real? I was. I went first. And as others followed, the conversation was real. It was unifying and it was strangely therapeutic and we approached our work for the rest of the day, not discouraged, but full of hope and full of optimism at what we could do together. I know from my own work as a management researcher that the most important thing that leaders can do to help other people recover from failure is to share their own mistakes. Now, at one point, I was making such a practice of this with my own children and particularly with my daughters, letting them know about mistakes that I had made growing up, that my daughter Amanda, she had to set me straight. Now, she had been spending some extended time with my mom, and she came home and she said, you know, Mom, Grandma tells very different stories about you. 
It was like she was saying, you know, grandma doesn't think you're such a loser. See, my mom told her what I did that was right. But I wanted her to know that I didn't always get it right. None of us do. Which leads us to number three. And most importantly, we can look to the right source for healing. Psalm 147 says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. True healing comes from our relationship with God. It comes from our Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we come in humility, weak things can become strong. That which has been broken can be made whole. Life is messy, isn't it? Things break. We break. The world will offer self-help elixirs to heal our wounds. It will offer retail therapies to help us live the dream. But these are little more than cheap band-aids that will inevitably bleed through. Voices from the dark will tell us that all is lost. The gospel teaches us that failure can be fixed and that healing is found in Jesus. Let me end by sharing just a couple lines from, it's from a favorite song of mine. It comes from the, uh, it's called You Will Be Found. It comes from the musical Dear Evan Hansen about a young man who feels uh, inadequate, lacking, alone, and um, broken, as if he's fallen, as if he's fallen from a tree and there's no one there to pick him up. It says, um, even when the dark comes crashing through, when you need a friend to carry you, when you're broken on the ground, you will be found. And then it goes on to say, um, out of the shadows, the morning is breaking, and all is new, all is new. Even if we've had our hopes dashed, we don't have to lose hope. We can find growth in failure. We can find joy in the mess. And when we become truly brokenhearted, this is when we find strength, his strength, a strength that truly endures. Thank you.